morning. Thank you. Uh, it's, my name is E.E. E. Wong. I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Machine Chat. With me today is Daryl Miller, who's our Head of Platforms. Also in the audience uh, online is uh, our CEO, CTO, and founder, Sanji Della. Most of the members of our team, actually, most of our team have been involved and passionate about the IoT space for over 15 years. So like I said, most of the members of our team have been involved and passionate about IT and also in the networking space for more than 15 years. Some of you guys remember when IT was called M to M, uh, so do we. Over this period of time, we've engaged with thousands of system integrators and device manufacturers trying to develop and deploy commercial IoT projects. And Machine Chat was founded with the singular purpose of delivering elegant, easy to use solutions that accelerate mass market adoption um, as well as uh, making it easier for, uh, for system integrators, engineers, and developers to accelerate the development of commercial IT projects. And so Daryl and I are excited today about sharing with you how we think IT projects can be de deployed and developed faster. So this slide, I, I love this slide because wouldn't it be great if IT was as easy as thinking up an idea configuring some hardware and software and being able to present it as a real prototype in minutes or hours. Uh, we already, you know, you can already do this in the IT world, um, but sadly in the IoT world, even 10 year, more than 10 years down the road, we still don't have this um, capability. So today most IoT projects have to go through several time consuming stages before rollout into an enterprise or a production environment. And the, despite the wide range of increasingly affordable connectivity and hardware options in the marketplace, nearly two thirds of IoT projects still never make it beyond the proof of concept stage. And even if you do, uh, the average time from idea to field pilot is about 36 months. So might be asking why is that? And um, Given the audience, I'm sure some of you guys know the answer to that. And the answer to that is simply time, lack of time. A lot of system integrators and engineers and developers who are trying to build a field, even a field-ready proof of concept, it can take weeks or months. And at that point, there's still no guarantee that your end user customer will buy in or want to adopt your solution. Um, what this results in is uh, many POCs are temporarily constructed or put together for early demonstration purposes and then rebuilt from the ground up for real-world field or, enter or enterprise environments. And since every IoT project environment can consist of different existing and new sensors and devices, different protocols, uh, most IoT projects end up being complex custom software deployments. Not surprisingly, a recent study found that more than 50% of the initial cost for an IoT project is just in the software and data storage development. So we call this the, the rough first mile of all commercial IoT projects, the pre-cloud IoT services and the data management layers that are foundational to bridging the gap between devices, their data, and the business applications they ultimately have to interact with. And, um, you know, it's, it, it was funny because a couple of months ago, I, I actually participated in one of these events, and uh, it was a great presentation. It was from IBM on blockchain and 5G and IoT, and one of the questions that was asked was, wow, this is great. How long does it take to, you know, what, what, what is the largest challenge that companies face in, in deploying your platform? And the response from the product manager was, well, to participate with our platform, you have to be um, IoT ready. And so this slide actually addresses the very specific things that companies have to do even before they can connect to an IoT solution, let's say in the cloud or even um, within their own company. With They have to make sure that um, the data has to be decoded and labeled and normalized in addition, because new sensors and devices that use different protocols or are built on proprietary platforms have to have custom software that's built to co connect, collect, monitor, and transform uh, their data. We, we call it, all of these steps involve getting the right data 
to the right application at the right time. So at Machine Chat, we believe that the first step towards reducing the cost of developing an IoT solution and accelerating the deployment of an IoT project starts with simplifying the path to completing this first mile with configurable edge-based IoT software. Our first product is Jedi One, and this enables developers in minutes to collapse the first mile of IoT data management layers into one step. And um, it allows developers and system integrators to rapidly and cost-effectively prototype field-ready IoT solutions, literally in minutes, not months. And in addition, that allows them to more readily engage with customers in demonstrating business value and defining customer business and experience requirements up front. Um, before I want to turn it over to Daryl, I want to point out that some of the things that some of these problems actually have real world consequences for the players, the IoT players in the space. You know, for uh, device manufacturers and sensor manufacturers, what it means is that the path to from um, the path to mass market adoption of their solutions is very long, and also the sales cycle is is extremely long. It's a long tail play because um, you may qualify with the customer, but then it may be three years down the line before they even decide that they're really going to use your solution in the in the field or in the enterprise. For system integrators, like I said, it creates a lot of expense right up front. If it takes you weeks and months to put together a, a proof of concept, you can't really scale your business that way. And for end user customers, um, what this does is it really only makes IoT available to uh, large companies that can afford it, uh, that can afford the people, the resources, um, and the time uh, to deploy a solution and maintain it. Um, it's not surprising, but only 10, less than 10% of businesses actually have an IoT project uh, being deployed, and less than 30% of middle market companies are doing IoT right now. And, and if you think about it, those are really the organizations that could benefit the most from IoT. So um, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Daryl, who will talk about more about the specifics of what Jedi One does and some sample use cases, and also how it works. Daryl? Hi. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Good, good. Well, good morning from Portland, uh, Oregon, where it's uh, dark and rainy. Um, an interesting thing is we talk to OEMs and uh, system integrators as well as end users. Um, we came to the realization that with a lot of uh, IoT applications and systems, there is not a need for all that data to have to go to a, uh, a cloud a solution be processed and then uh, uh, information put, pushed back. And as you see in this diagram here, uh, it's, it's uh, quite desirable uh, to take that information and process it locally and uh, deal with it uh, on site at the edge. And so as we designed our system, uh, our data management uh, services software, we uh, had that, that in mind. Um, it doesn't mean that we exclude the cloud. If you see here in the diagram, there is information that needs to be passed to the cloud, and, and we'll, we certainly facilitate that. Um, and there are other applications where the data, um, it's not desirable for that to go to the cloud, um, not even addressing all the costs that are associated uh, with those services and as EE talked about the development time required uh, to, to create uh, cloud-based solutions. So as we created uh, JEDI-1, we knew that it was important to be able to connect and collect the data, as we mentioned. It comes in from a variety of different sensors and devices. Um, there are within the uh, industry very um, ubiquitous ways of communicating over the network protocols like MQTT, um, HTTP, we're all familiar with that from uh, web browsing, but machines can also talk over that interface. Uh, there, there are things called RESTful APIs, uh, uh, another uh, common way to communicate. And then there's legacy devices, um, 
even 20 years ago in my career, uh, we were using uh, device servers to connect machines in a factory to the internet uh, or to the local network as well. And those use a, a TCP CSV type interface. So we knew we had to support all of those. And then there's a lot of sensors out there that speak um, very unique, uh, sometimes proprietary protocols. And uh, it's important to be able to bring those into this, uh, this infrastructure. And um, we're able to do that with, uh, with what we call custom data collectors. And this also includes uh, sensors that may be connected in other ways besides uh, a network, Wi-Fi or Ethernet. Uh, perhaps they're connected directly to a circuit board or they're connected uh, via USB. Um, we address that through custom data collectors. And then once all that data is coming in, we need to filter it, transform it, uh, aggregate it, and provide uh, monitoring of it. And that's done through our uh, rules engine um, and also the ability to take action on, on things that uh, uh, when those rules become true, um, a certain condition arises uh, to notify someone to be able to run another piece of software or pass information off to that software, or in the case of our diagram, pass that information up to the cloud. Um, we needed to have that mechanism uh, in the software as well. And uh, the data can be stored locally within uh, uh, the JEDI-1 uh, software suite, um, or as we mentioned, using MQTT or REST, we can push that data up to the cloud. So we'll talk about a few use cases. Um, this one is uh, addressing environmental monitoring. There's this um, broad topic uh, known as precision agriculture, and you guys probably know way more about it than I do. Texas is one of the, uh, well, is the largest agricultural state um, with a number of farms and ranches. I, I read that it was over 130 million acres of, uh, of land that, that's uh, being farmed. And so uh, this, this notion of precision agriculture takes technology and applies it to that industry to uh, improve yields, to reduce the use of pesticides, uh, to be able to you know, be better stewards of, of, of the environment and, and the land that's being farmed, and uh, to increase profits as well uh, for the farmers and to feed a, feed a growing world. And part of that is uh, commercial greenhouses. And we've had the opportunity to work uh, with some folks that are solving um, uh, issues within the greenhouses. And being able to monitor the things going on in that environment are very important. Things like air temperature, humidity, pH levels, soil moisture, uh, fluid levels of different fertilizers, and so forth. Um, in the applications we've worked with, they're using Wi-Fi sensors, either off the shelf or um, custom built sensors uh, from a variety of manufacturers. Sometimes they're even, you know, cobbled together by the, by the integrators. Um, in, uh, in this particular application, uh, it's running on an Ubuntu uh, Linux-based PC, if you're familiar with that operating system. And on that is running the JEDI-1 IoT software suite. And the advantage of this is it gives the farmers a single place to view all of these different uh, pieces of information coming in from these sensors in one place. And also alerts uh, can be immediately sent out when some measurement is out of whack. And that's using our rules and notifications. And I refer to these capabilities. We're going to, as we get into a demo, I'll show, show them to you specifically. Well, we've all become experts in, in public health and safety um, with this pandemic. And uh, it, it's nice that uh, we have light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, and, you know, a lot of sad things have happened, but there, there's also good things as well in that um, we've become more aware of, of uh, the need uh, for this uh, public health. 
And uh, we've seen some interesting opportunities. Uh, the one here on the screen is, is a real opportunity that, that we've had the opportunity to, to, to work with uh, uh, companies that are putting this together. Um, many buildings and facilities, campuses and so forth have hand sanitizers. And um, keeping those filled and, and the batteries uh, replaced can be quite a challenge. So what they have asked the IoT world to provide is a way of monitoring those and be able to dispatch um, folks there when, when service is needed. In this particular application, uh, they chose to use um, a wireless technology called LoRa. It stands for long range, and uh, it's a technology that Semtech, um, a company called Semtech in California, owns the rights to, and uh, it's it's a really neat technology. Batteries can last for years. Um, the information can travel uh, for kilo many kilometers um, on just a tiny bit of power. And uh, the the drawback is that you can't push a lot of information across that, that technology, but hand sanitizers don't have to say much, just that the battery is low or or that the soap level or, or sanitizer level is getting low. Uh, that information is aggregated with LoRa gateways. In the picture is a, a gateway from a company called Seed Studio. Um, and uh, they're made by a number of manufacturers. It takes all that information coming in from these hand sanitizers, aggregates it and forwards it on to the, uh, the network, either via Wi-Fi or uh, wired Ethernet or even a cellular network. And then on a, a central server, machine chat is running as well as a, a network stack for, for LoRaWAN. Uh, in, this, in this particular uh, instance, it was a, it, it's a software stack called ChirpStack. Uh, at the operations terminal then, they again get that single pane of glass, they're able to to see what's happening with the system and you know alerts can flash on the screen and so forth. And JEDI-1 uh, behind, behind the scenes can also send out uh, SMS text messages or email alerts to a uh, maintenance team to go and service uh, these sanitizers. So this is a very practical application um, that, that we've had the privilege of being involved with. So, Managing physical devices is, is a big part of what we're involved with. And in this particular instance, uh, we've had folks that want to monitor um, laundromats, washers and dryers. And uh, they've been able to put sensors on a variety of the interfaces within these, um, these machines. And this could this this diagram could apply to you know industrial machines as well and other other like uh, scenarios. Uh, information comes in from from uh, those machines, uh, the, you know the operating voltage, uh, the current they're drawing. Uh, in some cases, they may actually sense the vibration to do some predict predictive failure analysis uh, and be able to get out there and replace a motor or a belt or something or a bearing that's going bad before it actually goes bad because it's very expensive, you know, machine downtime can cost the business significantly. Um, so being able to monitor all this information, uh, including video or photos of what's going on has, uh, and legacy equipment, this is important and it can certainly reduce costs for these businesses. Uh, machine chats uh, software plays a central role. And in fact, uh, this notion of it running as a virtual IoT gateway. So we're able to take that data, ingest it, uh, do filtering and processing on it. As we mentioned, uh, rules and notifications and actions can take place. We can provide dashboards into that data. And then we can, uh, as, as a virtual gateway, we can then pass that. Um, information or some portion of it up to the cloud, whether you're using you know, Amazon or Microsoft or Google's product. And um, that upstream data 
can be uh, secured as well. A lot of these machines, especially the legacy ones, don't have any notion of security. You really don't want that data leaving the facility um, unsecure. So we're able to apply encryption and pass that on to the cloud. Some of the benefits that, that we offer here are a quick time to solution. So as he mentioned, in just minutes or hours for a complex product, you can have a working IoT solution uh, with Jedi One from Machine Chat. It runs on um, off-the-shelf off hardware, um, whether it's a PC or a single board computer of some kind. Uh, across a variety of, of operating systems. Uh, you control what gets sent to the cloud, and that reduces the, the cloud processing and storage costs. And I know in a former life, I had to pay the bills for the Amazon Web Services, and it gets really expensive. As you store data, uh, you know, every cycle of these virtual machines is, is counted in the cloud and, and you're charged for it. So it can add up to hundreds or thousands of dollars very quickly on a regular basis. And then another feature that we provide is um, helping with fault tolerance. Because we're a local machine, um, should that, that network connection to the cloud go down, we're still running. We're still uh, potentially collecting data um, locally if, if you've chosen to do that. Uh, we can store that information and forward it when the, um, the network, uh, the, the wide area network comes back. So those are some of the benefits that we provide in this virtual IoT gateway scenario. So uh, a little more on the virtual IoT gateway. Um, so with this local data storage, we're, we're allowing OT and IT administrators to preserve data records, to be able to create audit trails, and control how that data is managed and integrated and pushed up to um, cloud applications. Um, we enable the data extraction from legacy systems, as we mentioned, without exposing that, that uh, unencrypted data to the world. And we're able to reduce the cost of IoT implementations. Um, and uh, we help with improving the ROI on these IoT projects. So the demo we're going to show you today is um, at the center of it is Machine Chat running on an Ubuntu uh, Linux platform. This is a little tiny uh, single board computer from a company called Seed. It's their Odyssey platform. Really nice um, uh, commercial product here. It's about five inches by five inches by three inches high. And uh, it's like a full-blown PC. Um, if you haven't had a chance or haven't heard of Seed, they make a lot of products for IoT. Um, uh, their website is seedstudio.com. And we appreciate them providing that hardware for us to, to demonstrate this. Um, coming into this uh, single board computer is some environmental sensors. We have a temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor uh, here in my office that's sending over Wi-Fi uh, MQTT information. Uh, and then another sensor uh, sensing UV levels, which are at zero right now but uh, that's being sent over HTTP. And then we're using a browser on a Mac to uh, interface into Jedi One. And uh, that it, it doesn't have to be a Mac, anything with a browser can access uh, Jedi One from that server. Let me uh, take a moment here and switch to the demo. Are there any questions thus far? One okay. quick question um, uh, from, uh, Solomon online, uh, he would like to know uh, if you guys can speak to security as the solution appears to be edge-based and outside the normal physical layer of the larger um, data center. So if you could kind of better describe how you're doing your edge security. Um, so that's probably a question for Daryl and he can probably jump yeah. into it. We are edge. Um, uh, Absolutely, and that, that does provide some enhanced security since we're keeping most of the data. We, we are applicate, uh, the Jedi One allows for data to be 
stored and um, scrubbed and also decided as to what data goes to the cloud. That's, uh, but go ahead, Daryl. So we do, uh, we support SSL and TLS, um, the interface into uh, JEDI. Uh, you can use uh, HTTPS and then um, with, uh, as I'll show with WebSockets and MQTT and so forth, we also support a, a TLS um, with certificates, uh, keys, uh, and then we support the MQTT notion of uh, username and password on all of the payloads as well. So um, we have incorporated security across the, uh, the system. Are you, are you able to see the screen there, E? Oh, uh, hold on, yeah, let me. Yes, we can see the screen. Yes. Okay, thank see. you, Chris, all right. Um, good, so access to JEDI is uh, via any web, web browser. Uh, it's a reactive interface, so whether you're looking at it on, you know, on a desktop or, or your, your cell phone or a tablet, it looks great and it's very usable. Uh, it includes multi-user role-based access control. So you're looking at a login screen here. Um, if you log in as an, as an administrator, then you have access to the entire system. You can configure it, you can build dashboards and so forth. If you log in as a, as a user, then you have access to view the dashboards and of course receive notifications, um, email and text alerts. So that's all been baked in. Um, once you log in, this is the screen you see. Uh, and this literally just takes a couple of minutes to, to uh, put a single binary um, that JEDI is comprised of, uh, which is it's less than 30, 30 megabytes. Uh, once you execute that, you run it either as a program or set it up as a service, um, you see this screen. Really starts with data collection, as we mentioned. And out of the box, we have a number of data collectors uh, running. We have uh, HTTP, which is uh, very ubiquitous. Uh, MQTT uh, broker, uh, a lot of the sensors that have come out in recent years speak the MQTT protocol. So we're ready to ingest that information. And with these built in and running, that data is automatically brought into the system and then made available in other places like dashboards and rules and so forth that we'll look at in a moment. Just going to open up here the MQTT broker to give you an idea and this this also goes to the question that was asked. Uh, you can set up standard MQTT which actually doesn't use security um, or you can turn that off and use only uh, TLS or uh, secured um, MQTT. You can also use web sockets and secure web sockets as well. Um, I'm not sure if you're seeing my my pointer, but um, you can follow along yes. there. And then uh, this is where you would enter in uh, credentials. Uh, so a strong uh, server key and server certificate, root certificate. That can be valid, validated uh, uh, from a known certificate authority. And then I mentioned this notion in MQTT of a, of a over, overlying uh, username and password. Uh, within this collector too, there's a window down here that shows if data is coming in across that interface. And in fact, right now we do have a sensor, which is here in my office coming in wirelessly. We'll look more at that in a moment. I mentioned to you that um, TCP, uh, T TCP CSV, a legacy protocol, a lot of device servers from companies like Lantronics and Digi and others uh, use that to, to take old machines, uh, industrial machines and so forth, get them onto, onto the internet and the local network. Uh, we have, have that support as well. What happens though if a company um, has a, an IoT project and they need to create a proof of concept, but they don't have the sensors? Maybe the sensor is a room-sized device that's being developed. 
Well, we've uh, created this notion of virtual sensors. You can feed information from a spreadsheet into um, a virtual sensor, and it'll read that information on a regular basis, every so many seconds, every so many minutes, and take that data from the spreadsheet and feed it into JEDI as if it was coming from a, a real um, live sensor. And this is really helpful for folks that need to provide uh, a mock-up or proof of concept to their management or their peers of uh, what, you know, what this design is that the team, team is coming up with uh, before that hardware, that sensor hardware is even available. And in this case, we've created a couple of different ones. We have a, a one that uh, represents a, a varying voltage level and another one here that's a door switch, a door opening and, and closing randomly. So we'll see those here in a moment as we look uh, more at the uh, dashboards. Another, um, another notion we hinted at before was the custom plugins. Uh, you may want to bring data in from sensors that are connected directly to a computer. Um, maybe on USB you have a a data acquisition system. There's a company called Labjack. They make these nice uh, data acquisition systems and comes in through USB. No problem. Custom plugin uh, written in whatever language runs on the platform. It can be a scripting language like Python or C or Go or Java. Um, and often the manufacturers of these sensors or these systems like this data acquisition system already have um, the software written, and it's very easy to uh, bring that in and use it as a custom plugin within JEDI. Uh, for the example here, we can also use custom plugins to go out on the internet. There's there's a lot of wisdom out there that we can we can pull from uh, and bring that data in. So in this case, I'm pulling in additional weather information from Open Weather Map. That comes into the system and it looks just like any other sensor. So you can view it on a dashboard. You can build it into a rule. Um, it's, uh, it's very useful. So that is our data collection collector uh, section here. Daryl, maybe you can show the MQTT broker. That would be um, just uh, the collector there. Yeah, just sure. To... I had done that before, but I'll do it again. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, maybe I missed yeah. it. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, we went through each of these lines. Okay, great. Um, another another source of input, an important source of input for a um, an IoT uh, system is monitoring. Um, I showed you that example of the hand sanitizers. Key to that is that LoRa gateway because it's aggregating all that information from those uh, hand sanitizers coming in over the, the LoRaWAN network. If that goes down, you lose all that information. Uh, of course, you can have redundant gateways, but, but you want to monitor them. So you can, within our monitoring um, section, you can add those gateways. I have a gateway here loaded. You can load uh, machines that are out on the internet as well and monitor them, check for latency, packet loss, and some other uh, network parameters. That data also comes into our system um, and, and again can be acted upon. Um, so with both the data collectors and then this monitoring information that's being collected, all this incoming data goes into a, a data cache and then if you'd like, uh, you can store it locally um, uh, on the machine where JEDI is running in a, a CSV database. Options exist to, to limit the days of storage, uh, the specific metrics that are stored, or you know, if you choose, don't store anything. Perhaps you, um, you, you, you have no need for that. You just need to act on exceptions and and send an alert or an email when that occurs. No problem, we have folks using the, the system in that manner as well. Um, you'll notice point and click or drag and drop are, are um, uh, implemented 
thoroughly throughout JEDI. It makes it very easy to use. I want to show you now rules. That's really um, rules and actions are, are at the heart of things. And uh, very important part of the system, we allow uh, you to create simple rules or complex rules. In this case, you know, we have a, a simple rule, send notification if office temp is below 70 degrees. I have that disabled because my office is, at least this time of year, is always uh, below 70 degrees. And um, we'll take a look at that, though. You see it very simply um, takes that sensor input, temperature, operator, and then um, the, the temperature that you want it to trigger at. You can set how long that condition has to be true for uh, in, before it sends a, a notification or takes an action. And that can be, you know, in seconds or minutes. Uh, you can do a time window validation. Maybe you only want that to occur during certain hours of the day. Um, that's possible as well. And then in this case, the notification that we chose was uh, an email alert. Uh, you can also um, take action. You can run an external um, program, much like a custom data collector. We have these custom action plugins where you can run a piece of software. You can pass it the information on what the condition was that triggered the rule. You can also pass other parameters from other other um, data sources, as you see over here on the right. You can pass that to that program. And then it can pass, uh, run, JEDI launches it, it runs, it can pass uh, additional information back to us as well. So very, very powerful. I want to show you just how easy, we talk about easy, I, I should actually demonstrate that. So let's create a rule here. Give it a name, what type of, of rule. So we're going to do a condition, but maybe you'd want to do something on a schedule on a regular basis or on a schedule when a condition occurs. That's possible. So we select condition. All these data sources are coming into JEDI. I didn't have to type these in. It knows from that, uh, that incoming data. Uh, it's able to parse out what's coming in. Um, let's go ahead and grab. Um, Humidity, drag and drop. We can have an operator here. If humidity is greater than, select a number, 80%. That's like every day in the summer in Texas. <laughs> um, and then again, we can set a trigger, you know, if that's true for more than five seconds, or, you know, maybe we want to do minutes here. Because if you're sending alerts, you may not want them to, to come constantly, right? So, you know, you want to trigger it if it's true for a certain period of time. You can even say, you know, just, just trigger once per that interval. Um, and then we go into action. And we set that up. And this is where you specify, uh, do you want a notification? Do you want to run a custom action plugin? Or do you want to count the number of nodes uh, if you have lots of humidity detectors, say, throughout the um, greenhouse, like that example? You want to count the number of them that are over 80% or how often this has occurred, this particular rule. You can do that as well. So we say notification. We can give an email um, or if we have our um, SMS text interface, that up, we can put in a phone number and send a text. And not only do you get the custom message that you type in here, you also get all the details. So, you know, perhaps the humidity was 85.6, you'll get that information in the alert. So very, very powerful, very easy to set up. Now, once uh, once all this data is coming in, you set up your rules. And oh, by the way, these you can 
go on and on and cascade these. You can say if the temperature is this, if humidity is that, if pressure is this, um, if some information from the web, you can and that all together or or it. You can do all sorts of uh, uh, logic and create very, very complex rules to get to the um, the trigger that you're looking for. Once you've got that all set up, you will want to set up dashboards. Um, this is one that's default in the system. It's the device dashboard. It shows you all in real time, all the information coming into the system. And then you can selectively uh, add these columns to, to actually show the values. Um, we have our virtual uh, voltage monitor here. You can see that, that value changing. I think I have this set for a two second uh, update to this chart. Uh, you can see our door state changing. Uh, this is the actual information coming from the uh, sensor, the uh, sensor here in the office uh, via uh, MQTT. And then we also have um, our uh, sensor information from the UV sensor coming in here. So this is a good place as you're creating the system uh, to, to make sure that your sensors are, are uh, uh, speaking to you. And in a real life scenario, you would have a lot of the same sensors perhaps sending you uh, a property like, you know, wind speed or temperature. And then you can click on these columns and sort them from high to low. You know, perhaps you're looking at the battery level in one of those hand sanitizers or all, all of the hand sanitizers and you want to know the ones where the battery level is low. You could see that here in a single pane of glass. Now for a more traditional data dashboard view, um, these are these are simple to create. In fact, in a moment here, we'll, we'll create um, a widget, but you can see uh, the office temperature where I'm sitting here is at 64.8. Um, this tile widget allows you to, to use custom images and you can change that image based on the level of, of that sensor and you can have the text flash or not or change color. Uh, you can also display it in things like line or area charts. And then you can go back in, in time here and see, well, what, you know, what's the temperature been like um, over, over an entire day like yesterday. And you can move along and look at the various data points that came in. Uh, if you want to zoom in on something here to see a little bit more about it, you can. And uh, then you can save this as an image. Perhaps you want to send that on or you want to download this data set that's on the screen. You can do that, download it in CSV. And there's a variety of ways to, to actually in a line chart visualize that data using different downsampling methods. Um, Sometimes it's more convenient to look at information in a tabular format, and you can do that. Here's a table of all the values coming in from that, that one sensor. And uh, here, if we come down here to our uh, uh, gateway latency, we have a look at, you can certainly see that that is varying. Um, and if we go into, say, yesterday, we'll see some, some varying uh, network latency going on. Uh, virtual sensors, as I described, running, uh, pulling in data from a CSV file and displaying that uh, in, a, in a chart in this case, or down here, uh, the door opening and closing, it's actually a visual representation of that random door um, events uh, that again is is being pulled from from a spreadsheet. It's also useful for perhaps you have a door sensor, but you know it's it's a long ways away, and you want to simulate what would it look like if if there was actually activity going on. You can do that with a virtual sensor. So just really quickly, let me show you again how easy it is to create one of these charts. Um, we'll use that same. Data point, humidity, let's create uh, a, 
actually let's do a gauge uh, you give it a minimum value i hope we don't get down to zero in the office here so let's do something like 40 100 and then we'll go to that sensor which again that that list is automatically populated by what's coming in uh, as is these uh, properties uh, excuse me we were doing humidity there we go and that's uh, relative humidity and percent how often to update that and we add that and so there's the chart we just created we can scale it uh, you can also change the color of this i um, left it at green and red and then you can drag it around and put it wherever you'd like and um, you can put it down here with these others so that's how easy it is to to create um, something within a dashboard um, just very quickly show you what's called the system dashboard here you can um, put a floor plan of of your uh, you know shop floor or office or whatever and then you can drop different widgets uh, onto that floor plan and show what's going on again we have the the pressure here we have the uv level we have what that virtual door opening and closing and so forth and uh, a number of of things so uh, you can also put freeform text and so forth on the system dashboard again these are really good when you're creating something for, for users that may not be computer savvy, but they can look at this single screen and, and know exactly what they, they want to see. So um, that's a quick tour of JEDI. There's additional features. Um, if, if you're interested uh, on our website, you can uh, download a trial of our software. It runs on, as I said, a number of, of platforms. And it's available for sale at places like DigiKey and, and also from our website. So, E, I'll turn it back to you. So, just to recap, uh, Jedi One comes as a small single binary that needs no installation and is ready to go. It runs as a program or a service on x86 and ARM based gateways, Raspberry Pis, BeagleBone, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And it includes built-in support, as Daryl showed, for several protocols um, with network monitoring, uh, system data, and device dash and grid dashboards, as well as an integrated rules engine and notifications, all in one software package that's uh, installed on-prem for IoT. Um, it's, it's, you know, I think um, one of the great things about what we love about our software is the response that we get from from users who talk about how easy it is to start collecting, transforming, and directing data from any sensor or device. And with the cost of our, a single license costs $39 or $79, it's a no-brainer as to whether it's a cost-effective option for developers seeking to rapidly build a field-ready POC. So in closing, uh, I think, you know, at the beginning of this, I talked about some of the uh, issues with regards to time to completion and how those impact the different audiences that are involved in in IoT deployment. For, so how does JEDI benefit them? For sensor, device, and gateway OEMs, it provides a cost-effective and easily integrated ready-to-use solution that can accelerate their partners and end-user customers' time to market and deployment. When bundled with their products, and we've seen a number of partners come to us asking to bundle their products with Jedi One, it allows OEMs to also increase their customer wallet share. For solution integrators and system integrators, Jedi allows them to reduce the time, cost, and complexity in rapidly prototyping professional, field-ready solutions that can help them engage more readily with their customers. Um, it minimizes the number of experts you need to put together a POC, and you can quickly start to integrate IoT operational data with existing business applications. And finally, for the end user, it's pretty simple. What do customers want? They want you to be able to do IoT with a combination of their legacy and new, new infrastructure, as well as they want it now. So, um, so with Jedi One, you can actually give them a field-ready POC they can play with, and they can also start to engage with very quickly to see if there's uh, 
ROI and operational savings to be had, and it also speeds up uh, concept to deployment times. On that note, I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing and allow us to open up for questions. So uh, I'll start off. I have a couple of questions I, I want to kick things off with. So um, you mentioned legacy systems. So in my experience, I find that most legacy systems actually support uh, SNMP uh, protocol primarily, whereas it looked like uh, you were using newer, more modern stuff. Um, unfortunately, SNMP is quite old in what I see in most infrastructure settings today. Uh, do you have support for that, and how do you handle those older, older systems? So SNMP is um, certainly from my past at Lentronics and stuff. We've used that a lot. It it gives uh, certain network statistics and and you know off, often very very common in in network equipment. Uh, we we can address that currently with uh, the custom plugin interface uh, to be able to pull that in and. Um, I know that we have on our, our roadmap talked about including uh, SNMP support natively. Um, but when I referred to uh, legacy equipment, often the, the information with, with uh, some of these machines, they literally have a serial port on them, you know, a milling machine or something like that. Um, and then they use a, a device server to take that serial data, put it onto the network. And uh, and we consume that that directly. But I do agree with you to get network stats and things like that. SNMP is is quite common. Yeah, it sounds like you were talking like I'm used to seeing DB9 plugs with RS232 interfaces getting the data as well. Um, my second question yeah. um, is, what is your strategy for working within larger frameworking systems, primarily? I see potentially a need to either work with um, NMS or security systems or, or kind of larger things like, uh, and, and with NMS in particular, I can name things like uh, Zabbix, Incentral, Nagios, et cetera. But what's your kind of strategy playing within a broader portfolio of a, a bigger um, monitoring suite? Uh, so, you know, as I showed, we do provide um, interfaces. Um, what exactly were you thinking of um, wanting to do to to use machine chat to to acquire some of the information and then pass it to a larger system? What I com what I commonly see are um, with these types of things are facility management. Um, as you mentioned, you had temperature sensors, you had door sensors, etc. And when you start looking at facility management and uh, other larger things, it starts to look at a whole ITSM framework, and a lot of times people are using those with some type of NMS agent as well as another type of software to kind of uh, pull in that. So like you would pull in the, the IoT data, but you would have a larger management framework, and I could name a bunch, but you kind of get the general picture. Typically it's facilities management or network management monitoring platforms. So again, with, with the capability for that egress out of our system, I mean, we can certainly contribute um, uh, data, whether it's you know all of the data or filtered data or um, something else that's required by that system that maybe requires us to take, consume the, the sensor information and massage it in some way and then pass it on to those systems. So you know we, we are able able to do that. Um, and I would, you know, we'd need to look at, a, say, a particular platform and see, you know, what interfaces it has. Uh, and, and on our roadmap, we do have some additional ways uh, using things like gRPC, um, you know, beyond MQTT and so forth to be able to make it easy to integrate with uh, other software platforms. Uh, we did a demo um, recently where we used uh, gRPC to integrate with TensorFlow, for an example. So we were bringing in image data into to JEDI, passing it through gRPC to TensorFlow. TensorFlow would then, uh, in this case, analyze the image, look for how many people were in a room, and then pass the count of people back to us, and then we could take action on it. So um, again, there are, there are certainly ways to get, get information in and out of us. I have a question. As it relates to the sensors, 
what 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 kind of costs are involved in those sensors? Are they relatively inexpensive? <laughs> so I, I had a little trouble hearing that, but I think you ask about what are the costs associated with sensors. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. correct. He was. Uh, this, what's the kind of the, the cost range of some of the sensors that you guys commonly work with? Yeah, so you know sensors that. Um, so we work with a number of single board computers, you know, running a variety of operating systems, but they they often have connectors um, on them that accommodate sensors, and you can literally get some sensors for you know under a dollar a piece uh, at that level at a component level. Um, you know, that's great, though, for somebody who's an OEM or whatever and can build a build a system. Um, if you need to get finished sensors that are in a case in a housing and perhaps have network connectivity or Bluetooth or something like that, you know, then they can cost $10, $20. Or if you want an air quality sensor with a variety of uh, sensing parameters, those can be many hundreds of dollars. So um, it, it really depends uh, on on what type of sensor you're looking for and how integrated it is. And I think uh, Ed's going to wrap awesome. things. All right. Yeah. Uh, e. e and Daryl, I very much appreciate uh, you guys uh, uh, presenting. This has been very interesting and uh, very good information. So uh, we're going to turn this over to Gary in a few moments uh, for all those folks that are online uh, to hopefully carry on questions and, and conversations and uh, share some more information about what uh, Sheen Chat is doing and what other people online are doing and, and see if there's a uh, collaboration that could be possible or partnerships or uh, just answer questions that people might have. So uh, are there any other announcements uh, in the room of uh, meetings coming up or uh, events or something that we all need to know about? I know we're getting uh, close to the end of the COVID uh, lockdown, so hopefully we'll be able to start having our uh, robust meetings again and do our networking. Uh, next month, we're going to have uh, Phosphorus Cybersecurity come and talk. Uh, this guy <laughs> hacked uh, DOD back when he was in high school and got caught. And then he went to work for the federal government then as a white hat hacker. So he's got stories to tell. I, I talked to him for 30 minutes and wanted to hang on and talk to him longer. So next month, it will be very interesting as well. So uh, if there's nothing else uh, here in the room, then I'm going to turn it over to Gary and let the folks online then uh, carry on. EE e. and Daryl, thank you very much for presenting today and being a part of this. Uh, take care, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Ed. We thank appreciate you. your time, too. Everyone's thank time. You, thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Um, well, this is Gary Ramsey. I'm going to go ahead and, and take over from this point. So what, I, what we're doing right now in the background is we're opening up everyone so that they can participate here as panelists. So um, I think what we'll do, first of all, is just go through the list here and have everyone introduce themselves. If you can just, uh, obviously, your name, rank, serial number, but effectively just uh, tell us what you're, uh, who you work for, uh, and what type of uh, uh, interest that you have around IoT, if you can. And then uh, if you have a question, go ahead and, and throw that out at this time, too. So we'll start off with uh, Andy. Andy, can you unmute yourself and, um, and just introduce, uh, introduce yourself and, and uh, uh, what, you're, what you're working on? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK, hey, this is Andy Sloat. Um, I'm with a company called Object Spectrum. Uh, and uh, from looking at your presentation today, we're actually somewhat of a competitor in the same space that you guys are in. And I do uh, a variety of things. My official title is marketing customer success, but uh, do some sales and uh, some um, documentation and uh, things like that as well. Uh, a great presentation today, though. Uh, I, I appreciated hearing about your about your offer. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. John? Hey, good morning, everyone. John Hamer. I'm a, a center engineer with Verizon Business, uh, running mostly uh, projects in the LA area for network uh, and infrastructure expansions uh, to kind of help all this stuff that we're talking about today work. 
Uh, so I'm not a marketing and sales guy. I'm actually an engineer guy, but <laughs> I, I, I'm interested in everything IoT and, and, and blockchain technology. I've known Ed for a while, so I, I really enjoyed the presentation today. So thanks very much. Thanks, John. I'm glad I didn't talk about reducing cellular data traffic and <laughs> and uh, uh, reducing those charges. But <laughs> and, uh, and thank you, John, for getting up so early. So uh, you're seeing the same uh, sun's just starting to peek out right now for both of us, I guess. Exactly. So yeah, thanks very much. It's a great welcome. example of uh, the fact that we're we're branching out beyond just the North Texas area. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're going international. So uh, hopefully the sun doesn't set on IoT. That said, uh, <laughs> Sanjeev, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, just do a quick introduction? Hey, this is uh, Sanjeev. I'm um, founder of uh, Mission Chat. <clears throat> and I think uh, E and uh, Donald have done a fantastic job uh, showcasing uh, what we have. Uh, we're pretty passionate about uh, making IoT as simple as possible so that um, everybody could uh, benefit from, you know, uh, monitoring something to save money or, you know, make things safe. Uh, we would love to kind of make it uh, really, really plug and play. So thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, getting up early or uh, taking time off your schedules to join us. And thanks, Ed and Chris, for setting this up. Thank you very much. Solomon, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Uh, we've already got your a little bit of an introduction there in the chat, which we appreciate. Uh, so if you could go ahead and expand on that. Sure. So I'm Solomon Israel. I'm the CTO for uh, SkyMax Network. We're a 5G telecom service provider uh, targeting uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So Kenya is our launch market. Um, great presentation to EE e. and Daryl. Uh, so much appreciated. And um, it sounded like, yeah, so um, we'll, we'll stop there. I'll ask my follow-up questions afterwards. All right. Well, if you've got a question, please go ahead. Sure. It's, uh, it sounded to me, uh, with respect to this, just following up on the security discussion that you were having with Chris earlier, um, first off, you're a pure software play. Um, going on to customer provided hardware is that a correct um, is that a correct understanding um, it, yes customer provided hardware but it, it it's a wide variety of hardware you know x86 uh, platforms you know like you would possibly find in a PC or a, a Mac or a single board computer uh, arm based platforms which run the gamut you know from from uh, cellular gateways to um, yeah, a variety of other um, OEM type type products. That's yeah. That's no. That's that part of it is clear, and that's fine. It really, my question was related towards security, and as we move things further and further to the edge, the physical security aspects that we sort of take for granted are are lost in the process, or have to be paid attention to in a different way. And so that's really what I just wanted to make sure I understood in that process is that element of physical security of a device that it really depends on what the customer is providing and that they're providing a, you know, a hard asset lock, if you want to call it that, uh, to prefer to yes, bring it, compromise to the device. Yeah, in fact, we can run on, you know, a lot of folks have their, their uh, uh, servers in a, in a, a locked and and card keyed glass house right within and we can certainly run on a, a virtual instance of, of, a, of a, an operating system and be under lock and key in that instance and because often the uh, data coming into us is from the network even if it's running on some kind of a gateway that may be a standalone portable device that can be secured as well um, because it doesn't have to necessarily be sitting right next to a machine that might be out in the open. Okay. Thanks. That was it. That was that really. That, that is a that is a really good a good point, though. Uh, you know, it's it, it is easy to tamper with with a lot of this equipment if you're not careful. Okay. So, what this is all about is kind of an opportunity for those who weren't able to physically be at the HEXA facility and uh, 
uh, in Richardson, Texas, North Texas. Uh, so we kind of have branched out over the last year or so and, and created this interactive platform uh, to be able to continue during COVID the, the networking aspect of what this group was really founded around. Uh, Ed and I like to kind of um, kind of laugh about the fact that uh, we have a, a great group of guys and gals who get together. Um, and oh, by the way, we've got a presenter. So uh, that said, we really want to piggyback on, on uh, the fact that we were all brought together today because of the presentation. And I want to ask the community because the, the bottom line is this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce that failure rate that was talked about in the presentation. How do we increase the, the success factor for proof of concepts or for just IoT projects uh, straight up? As we all know, um, it's kind of a, a nasty uh, secret that um, you know, about 60% of IoT projects fail. And quite frankly, I think that's because of the fact that the ecosystem, all the puzzle pieces just aren't necessarily in place. So that said, what I want to do is throw out to the group here, what is it that you're looking for to help build your personal ecosystem? Uh, is there any ask at this point uh, that you might have the group? that uh, you can go ahead and, and effectively just do some interactive networking at this point. So I'll throw it open. And if we don't get any responses, I'm going to throw out some more questions. So anyone have any, uh, any uh, comments or, or, or needs at this point in, in our IoT community here? Between Daryl, myself, and Sanjeev and the rest of our team, we've probably talked to you know, thousands of system integrators as well as OEM manufacturers, and, and probably uh, on the system integrator thing, and what we've heard from them is that when they go into a, a potential project, or, or let's say it's an IoT deployment, or whatever, the, the request that they get from customers is, how much of this do I have to rip out? Um, I'd like to try to use as much of the existing resources that I have to do this. How fast can I do this? Um, and I think, the, the challenge is, right, is uh, probably one of the most uh, profound conversations I had was one where a system integrator said to me, he goes, you know, if you could figure out a way for me to spend more time configuring and less time coding, that would solve my problem. And, uh, you know, that would solve one of my key problems because uh, system integrators and solution architects get very little credit for this sort of first mile Right, the first mile uh, portion of the of the data management IoT data management layers, it's necessary, but customers want to get to the point where they can see what that you know they want to they want to be able to extract that data and start to really act on it. Um, but when it takes weeks or months or or sometimes even years to build that application um, and to have it be able to operate in a in a heterogeneous environment. Um, that's also scalable, then it's, uh, it becomes difficult to, um, you know, that, that's the, you know, that's, that's where the, the, the business value starts to deteriorate. <laughs> so, so can, can, I, can I summarize what you're saying by, uh, by the comment, we're looking for actionable insight and we want to be able to monetize that as fast as possible. Exactly. Okay. What do you think is slowing us down? I think it's the customization, right? You've got many different uh, machines, many different sensors out there. It's, you know, in, in my previous life, I worked with a lot of FAEs, um, application engineers, who are showing um, networking technologies and, and things like that. And you know, oftentimes they might take five or six weeks to put together a, a presentation, or, or several weeks to put together a presentation of a demo to a customer, right? And even then, that demo was not something that the customer could play with and engage with quickly and say, you know, I really want to have this and I really want to have that. Uh, hopefully through our presentation today, we've shown something that those folks can now create something. And, and in many cases, the use cases that Daryl showed, those are real world users of our product who are putting together, you know, and, and their response has been to us is, Wow, this is great. You know, I was able to put this together in days. Um, we just, you know, we even had um, 
a group out of uh, the defense space in the in the in the uh, uh, defense arena uh, do it. He, he just sent us an email saying, "Wow, I blew away my colleagues because I was able to show them something, and they realized that I did it in weeks versus, you know, versus you know, uh, versus months." Yeah, that it's always a challenge. I, I think back uh, in my experience uh, working with like a board of directors, and you're trying to get them to to get behind you on on a great idea that some engineers have had, or product marketing has brought this idea to be able to mock that up to a to a really compelling uh, visual proof of concept to them, or even executive management. Uh, if you don't get that buy-in, you know it's it's hard to uh, you know, get initially funded internally in a company and and or to get continued funding within that company. So, um, as E.E. E. said, um, and just with FAEs, but even internal resources can quickly demonstrate, you know, what the point of an IoT project is and what it what it may look like and, and so forth uh, with, the, with the help of our tool. So, let me ask you this. Do you... Uh, traditionally go in and, and have, uh, let's just say, consulting sessions with uh, the executive team prior to putting together a POC, or, or do you just typically jump right into the POC and, and try to prove I, uh, an ROI immediately? So in my past experience, um, unfortunately, I didn't really have a tool like this. So in order to be able to, I mean, you would put together a PowerPoint presentation, right? And, and, and hope that you can get your idea across. Uh, you know, you might bring in some others to try to, to explain and justify, um, you know, the, the reason we would fund and pursue this project. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a challenge. But uh, there were times, there were times that we had enough time that we could take an engineer and say, you know, you need to spend the next month or two and mock this up and try to pull together all the different pieces and, and graphics and so forth uh, uh, to create a, a mock-up in software that, that showed what we were after. But, um, you know, that takes a long time and it's often... Uh, not as compelling as in, in you know I yes I'm biased I work for machine chat but I spent a, you know decades um, uh, in the OEM world and uh, in in engineering and would have loved to have had a tool like this. Well, I guess I'm I'm kind of asking questions about the the process prior to really getting into developing the POC. Uh, have have you had experience where you're actually getting buy-in from the executive team and setting up uh, some type of, uh, I guess, a goal, a goal or, or, or drawing that, that, that goalpost spot on the field and saying, if we can get across this particular line and show you X, Y, and Z, uh, will you continue to fund the project? Are, are you... Are you getting up uh, in front of some of these projects from that perspective? Because what what I've seen in the industry, or you know, I'm getting some feedback is around the fact that it's politics that sometimes is holding back these projects, and not necessarily the technology. Are you are you seeing that? Well, I think um, probably one of the things about our technology is that we didn't create it so that you'd have to spend a lot of time in a boardroom, right? I mean, it's it's. I mean, our our goal is to equip the engineers and the developers and the solution architects with a tool that allows them to showcase something that's very professional looking right off the bat. Um, I've sat in rooms with presentations at the board level, right, where somebody comes in and they say, hey, they have a great idea, and you look at the screen and you're like, okay, what is it? And you see, you know, a bunch of uh, very simple, um, looking in there say, well, this is a mock-up, right? Either that or they come in, like Daryl said, with a slide presentation of some, what something will look like, and there's no way to engage with it. So I agree with you. There might be some politics, but usually politics is disguised in the form of, well, you know, I don't really see where the, you know, what real data do you have? What real, um, you know, what is this going to what cost is this going to involve, right? Um, when you look at the land, yeah, go ahead, Daryl. I was going to say, you know, taking off the machine chat hat here, though, 
we do run into I, uh, larger IoT implementations where it does get caught up in, you know, whether it's politics, bureaucracy, or even just the the sheer integration. Um, they have to go get the sensor designed. Um, you know, they have to work out the the logistics of, of procuring it, have, having it manufactured, procuring it, um, pulling in other vendors for, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, cloud cloud uh, application or um, other things that are needed for the system. So, I mean, it does happen and, and we do have a number of projects where we've, you know, been involved and, and they still months and months later are still kind of working and grinding through through those issues. So I'm just kind of, I'm trying to drill in a little bit here on, on why, why aren't we more successful than we are in, in the IoT industry? So let's, let's look at the positive side of this. At what point, and what does it look like to you uh, when you know you pulled that ROI out and you're showing all kinds of, uh, uh, obviously, return on investment? What, what does that look like for you guys when you're seeing that your, your, your client turn that corner and, and, and want to go full bore on a project? For us, with some of the projects um, uh, we engage and, you know, our solution is perfect, there are others that, you know, perhaps need some customization or some additional capabilities. And, you know, being a, a young and nimble company, with lots and lots of, of experience in tow, um, we're able to do that that for people. Um, you know, you, it, it would be hard to get, and we, you know, we, we love the services provided by Amazon and AWS, but, you know, to get their attention to, to, to modify something on their system would be quite difficult. So, uh, you know, that, that's an advantage we have. Okay. Looking at the bright side of IoT, um, here, I think the key is how do you uh, turn things into plug and play rather than custom? That's the key thing that we are after. So um, IoT has been largely custom over the years, and um, that adds a lot of uh, time from the time that uh, somebody needs to implement a monitoring solution in a hospital to when they can actually experience the whole solution in there and the time between the start and the finish is um, where I think there are a lot of uh, good things that can be done. Um, uh, today, I think it's all about instant gratification and um, how quickly can you kind of get to the results. Uh, the, the sooner people can realize the, the benefits of IoT, everybody appreciates the benefits of IoT. People are seeing a lot of saving and terms of uh, reducing wastage and um, you know making things safer and uh, cutting down on um, insurance costs and all sorts of benefits from IOT but the thing is you know uh, implementations people look at uh, custom hardware uh, designing custom uh, sensor boards and writing software from scratch um, there are benefits in writing software from scratch uh, writing uh, uh, developing uh, custom form factor sensors and gateways but I think the real promise of IoT where, uh, you know, even getting close to some of the numbers that um, uh, companies talk about, uh, millions of deployments or even sometimes billions of deployments, um, to get there, I think cutting that time, making it more plug and play uh, off the shelf, um, I think holds a lot of promise for IoT here. That, that, that leads right into my next question, which is, how do we go? How do we scale? How do we go ex exponential with uh, with uh, IoT? Because we, we always hear the billions and billions of devices will be on the internet by you know some date, right? Uh, how do we uh, how do we monetize or or take advantage of a platform like what like what you have to to take that to the next level? And I think you kind of touched on it a little bit, but maybe you can expand on just how we can go big with the platform. Yep. Um, perfect question there. The thing is, uh, you know, uh, starting with uh, smartphones, smartphones started at home. Uh, it's all about ease of use, and they replaced uh, some of the business phones like BlackBerry at work. And very similar to that, 
Today, if you look at it, uh, what happens when we buy a Amazon Echo or you buy a Google Home or a, a Home Pod, you know, it's just that experience where you order it, it comes home, you pop up an application, you click a few things here and there, and uh, you start using it. And uh, when it goes to when we go back to work. And we try to do the same thing I, uh, as an engineer, uh, say, at a company, at a factory. And I kind of have this idea saying that if I can monitor that temperature of that pipe carrying steam, and if I can uh, look into that and see the utilization, or I mean, I have a laser cut machine, cutting machine at work and want to monitor how often it is being used. Do I need to order another laser cutting machine? Because it's just that my team's asking for three more machines. You know, Is it time to invest? It's just a, a very, very long process uh, starting from that uh, moment. You know, So if we can make it as easy as uh, um, ordering um, a sensor and ordering a gateway and you know both arrive in the mail and you fire up an application click a few buttons and uh, enter a few things here and there that's going to change the game for uh, commercial and industrial iot if it were that plug and play yeah i, I think leveraging on zanjeev's comment um you know it, it kind of goes back to what i talked about at the beginning of my presentation which was that you know, if you look at the IT world today, right, it doesn't matter what laptop or phone or tablet I bring into a network. It, you know, if, if or a printer or, you know, I mean, there's literally thousands of different printers or copiers or whatever. My IT guy can come over to my desk or, well, if I was in the office anyway, but, and in minutes, um, he can, you know, he can configure me and I'm, and I'm up and running. Um, I think the key to proliferation in the IoT market is that, as Sanjeev says, plug and play that same type of, or what we might call plug and configure, right? Uh, configure and play. Um, it, that same experience. And that's what we're trying to deliver with Machine Chat's Jedi One and, and our Jedi platform in general. Um, is, that, is that tool that regardless of what your machine or your device or your sensor is, your, your gateway, uh, you can have that experience. You don't have to learn a new programming language. You don't have to worry about, you can bring in those, regardless of the native protocol of that device or sensor, you can get it up and running and start seeing the data and seeing the business value from that, from that information in minutes. I think you guys are reading my mind from my questions today. <laughs> How far away? Um, I, think, I think Solomon had his hand up. So, yeah, I think it was just a question I wanted to ask. Is you know a lot of the. I think the question here is to to riff on Gary's earlier point of sixty percent failure rate. Is your experience in talking with the systems integrators or even the end users, is there clarity around the use case and around what the value proposition is? Or is it, which is really more of a business question versus are we dealing with a technical issue, which is how do you basically have a horizontal platform that makes things easy to happen, if that makes sense? Yeah, it does. I can take that question. Sure. Uh, this is Sanjeev. Uh, I'll give you a very specific uh, example without uh, mentioning the uh, companies involved, uh, Solomon. Uh, it's uh, the number of uh, people who are involved in a given project. So we see not one, not two. Some of the uh, commercial IoT projects, uh, we often see four, five, and even sometimes six system integrators in a project. And um, the chain, as we all know, is only as strong as its weakest link. And uh, we have seen uh, projects uh, fall apart because uh, there is one uh, particular link that falls apart here. And uh, uh, for example, there is a project uh, 
that we are involved with. Uh, it's a pretty big project, and uh, it's a monitoring project. It's a resource monitoring project, a very simple one. It should have been plug and play. And uh, that project has been open since um, September, October of last year, and we are already in March. Uh, this relates to uh, some of the monitoring issues related uh, to COVID-19 and uh, occupational safety and um, sanitization and things like that. Uh, that project is still open, and there are about uh, four different um, uh, groups involved that are trying to bid on that particular project. And um, it's uh, it sounds every time um, uh, we are in a meeting on this particular project, it's uh, as if it just started yesterday. You know, um, it's just the number of people involved, and it's it should have been like more like a one day project to get this done but it's just the number of um, parties involved um, the number of business decisions and what's in it for me for each of these companies uh, some people bring uh, gateways to the equation some people are bringing sensors to the equation some people are bringing microcontroller boards uh, some people um, are in integrating it into the database and some people are about deploying it and warranties and service. It's just the number of pieces in each of these projects. Um, and it has to make business sense for each company involved. But uh, it could have been just that the IT department at that end customer who raised the bid, it should have been like the IT department, uh, like what E mentioned, uh, going and buying the uh, sensors they needed and downloading the software and get going. I mean, they would have saved a ton of time and money if it was that or if they could uh, go to one system integrator and say, can you do this? And um, if it was within the reach of that one system integrator, it's beautiful. So that's been our observation consistent across uh, many commercial IoT projects that we have seen. It's just the number of um, people involved, different businesses involved. Okay. Yeah, I think Thank what you. you're saying, yeah, I think what you're saying, Sanjeev, too, is that uh, the challenge I think for most system integrators is that IoT is so complex, they can only focus on a certain area of it. Um, you know, a lot of system integrators are, you know, uh, especially the smaller ones, they, they may be focused on one part of the application, building the hardware piece or suggesting the, you know, and then they have to bring in other folks, I think is what you're saying, uh, to to help define the different elements. Um, and then on top of that, there's there's another layer, so. And this particular opportunity that we are seeing, this specific example that I've taken, I can already see how it's become a, a million dollar project, what was supposed to be maybe a $20,000, $30,000 project with like almost uh, seven companies that I could see in that project right now. Uh, it can, for everybody to kind of, uh, for it to make business sense for each of the companies involved, I can already see it's like a million dollar project. All right, I've got another question. IoT Utopia. I'm going to define that as, let's just say, today we can drag and drop uh, effectively a digital twin onto our laptop, and we've got a printer that's already defined, and all we need to do is just send, send jobs to it, and it prints off. At what point do you think the IoT industry, and since you're a player at the, at the platform level, where I can drag and drop uh, an icon representing a piece of hardware onto the platform and just have it um, ingest itself into the system and potentially drop uh, from another area of the screen a set of business rules and we're off and running. How far away do you think we are from that type of utopia at this point? You want to make any, uh, any predictions? Excellent question. Um, I think uh, there are two aspects to that. Uh, today, we are able to experience that in the IT world because of uh, the standardization of the operating systems that we use. Uh, Windows, um, Linux, and Mac have emerged as um, a, a very good standardized platform. 
And I see that happening with uh, Microsoft's uh, DTDL, um, the device twin description language effort, and AWS has their own. And these are the modern operating systems, um, Azure and um, AWS infrastructures in creating that uh, thing. You know, so you will have Azure drivers and AWS drivers, but uh, there is still this missing piece at the edge layer where not every commercial and industrial um, a machine, a device, or a system will be able to uh, be. So, so today, if you have to kind of uh, build a printer or uh, if there is a um, printer manufacturer, they need to supply their drivers. And they know that, uh, OK, I need to supply drivers for Windows. I need to supply drivers for um, uh, maybe Mac and then Linux you know, uh, in some order. Uh, today, the, the struggle is um, the rip and replace uh, issue, where uh, you have industrial motors like $300,000, $500,000. You have equipment uh, $40,000, or maybe like it's a CAT scanner, um, a million dollar uh, MRI, um, whatever it is. Um, how do you kind of bridge that gap where the manufacturers feel comfortable of coming up with this driver or an adaptation layer? without having to throw away the equipment or having the customer throw away what they have and come up with this new. And um, uh, just touching up on where we are headed, we want to be that layer where we fill that gap to upgrade the existing equipment so that it can talk to AWS, you know, it can talk to Azure. And uh, the standardization would happen at the Azure and the AWS layers. Does that make sense? I think so, yes. I mean, it's interesting that, uh, that we're referring to the cloud infrastructures that are out there as, as operating systems. I, I think that's, that's very key. I think you've kind of hit on something there. Um, let me throw another, uh, another weird one at you. With the capability that we have today of being able to drop a VM on an edge device, uh, where do you see the industry going where you can actually repurpose an edge device by just changing its identity or changing its purpose by dropping a different VM on that particular uh, um, edge device with uh, you know various different arrays of sensors? Are, are you seeing any any purpose for something like that, or uh, do you think that's something that's around the corner for us? Um, the edge gets a little interesting with uh, the number of people calling their solutions um, uh, edge compute today, including companies like HP and Dell uh, rebranding some of their uh, yesteryear kind of um, you know platforms and things like that, uh, upgrading them and calling them edge compute. So edge is getting uh, very interesting. Answering your specific question regarding um, uh, virtual machines and um, the more like uh, what you call uh, uh, composable infrastructure. The key there is um, cost. I think one of the main factors that's, uh, that uh, can uh, propel IoT into mainstream uh, use cases, mainly in the commercial and industrial space, is how do you get the cost of the edge components as low as possible because uh, of the potential volumes and uh, where you deploy, what does it get attached to? Um, containers, I think, are one um, very promising technology in that particular space where you have a edge gateway, whether it's a single board computer or um, uh, an L uh, LTE gateway, or a Wi-Fi router, which has, like Cisco um, has started upgrading their Wi-Fi routers, adding Bluetooth uh, LE support to their Wi-Fi access points so that they can not only enable the IT equipment to get onto the network, but also start uh, getting the IoT uh, sensors onto the network. Um, I see the gateways, um, the networking gateways, as a, a platform for uh, deploying uh, uh, the IoT-specific software workloads very close to the sensors, and the sensors becoming as inexpensive 
as possible uh, tracking the semiconductor trends. Okay. Well, let me give you a, an example, I guess, of what we could call an edge device, a robot. Um, and putting a robot there on the edge and being able to change its function or its purpose by dropping a different VM on it. Uh, maybe it runs around as a vacuum cleaner. Maybe the next step it's uh, doing something else that uh, is capable of, you know, the mechanics that are, that are built into that particular device. Um, can your platform address something of that um, magnitude? Yes. So um, Daryl very briefly touched upon this concept of uh, gRPC. And um, we see ourselves as an orchestration layer. Uh, there was a very good question regarding um, management and network management systems, NMS, um, a little while ago. And um, not all of the edge devices are uh, capable or the manufacturers, um, you know, do they need to kind of invest that kind of uh, money into uh, building their own teams with uh, network management expertise or to that matter even container management expertise you know does everybody need to know uh, what a, a, a kubernetes uh, container infrastructure look like for managing these profiles or personalities uh, so uh, that's a very uh, interesting space for us in terms of how do you uh, deploy uh, these personalities um, onto various devices. For example, um, when you look at tiny ML or even machine learning inference models, uh, that is very close to the question that you just uh, brought up, which is uh, it need not be a personality as such, but uh, just changing the inference model that you apply to a Toshiba induction motor versus a GE's motor. And if you have like a, a fleet of uh, GE motors and uh, Toshiba induction motors, and uh, different models, you might have to deploy different uh, inference models depending on uh, which uh, hardware that you are uh, you know, dealing with. So it's just not at a, a personality, but even uh, the, uh, when it comes to machine learning, there's quite a bit of an opportunity there. And quite frankly, that's, that is what I was had really in the back of my mind was the fact that you really and I like the way you you refer to that as personality, uh, because you know a motor is a motor, but depending on the manufacturer, depending on its use case, uh, depending on the sensors that are available, you're going to want to change that model. You're going to want it to have different type of analytics uh, capabilities, and you may want to change that model on the fly or uh, as it, as you start uh, uh, bringing additional data into the into the model from say the enterprise itself, um, and seeing just effectively how maybe the the throughput of uh, uh, products that are going through the the manufacturing facility and how that mo that particular motor that you're pulling analytics from may interact with that. So um, again, I was just kind of given the use case of the of the robot to kind of take it a little further beyond just the um, changing the personality of, of the of the model uh, that's sitting there on the edge. Um, we're getting uh, close to the uh, to the end here. So what I want to do is just uh, step back and and see if there's any uh, any questions. I've I've been asking all the questions here. Uh, just I guess maybe to keep the conversation going. But uh, anyone out there having any questions or at this point may maybe have. Um, uh, any any particular needs or comments? Um, we'll just throw that up before we uh, close this down. Well, well, Gary, I actually I have a question for the group, if that's okay. Please. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering what type of use cases are folks seeing right now? What is exciting them about IoT and and how they see things going? I'm I'm curious to see what what use cases the folks in the group are seeing and, and what's exciting them about what's what's what they think is going to happen in 2021 and as we go into 2022. Uh, Andy uh, or John, do you want to you want to throw in a comment there? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll uh, make a comment. I, I, uh, as far as working directly with customers, um, I actually am just getting into that. I have one customer and it's in the manufacturing space. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, some manufacturers are positioned better to uh, take advantage of the movement to industry 4.0 than others. And the one mm -hmm. that we're working with has some good uh, base capabilities that are going to make this um, that are going to make this easier for them than probably for others. But uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff to do with them, everything from machine monitoring to some asset tracking and also uh, tracking some uh, climate conditions inside and outside the factory. So I, I think it's really interesting and, and one of the, I think one of the more interesting uh, customers that you could work with. So you're coming across the what I'm going to call the traditional track and trace phone home. Uh, I'm not sure you know, what you're asking. I was just saying, are you, is, is the use case could be kind of boiled down that you're coming across uh, kind of in, in the traditional areas that we've had IoT kind of from the very beginning, which was uh, tracking and tracing high value assets and then uh, the capability of that, that asset to, to phone home and say, hey, I got a problem. Mm, we've got some asset tracking, but, uh, you know, the, the machine monitoring is the is you know, one of the one of the main uh, things that we're focusing on with this. So we're talking about machine monitoring, which will eventually translate into predictive maintenance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So full stream analytics, effectively. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. John, any comment so, on your end? Any interesting projects that you're seeing? Oh, sorry. I didn't know if you were talking. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say. Oh, sorry. There are a lot of jobs out there, I guess, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're saying some, yeah. some interesting stuff. I mean, I, I, I get excited when I see a new use case, and that just says I've been in this industry too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the, uh, so the main projects that I've been involved with lately are actually to increase um, capacity, you know, band capacity and all, to enable the edge devices. Uh, so it's really more not on the wire. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier the you know Verizon wireless and the wireless side, but I'm actually more involved on the on the landline and the network IP side. So we see we see a lot of new capacity being required to enable edge computing and of course you know carrying the 5G network. So that's that's what I've been involved in mostly most nice. lately. Is that all? All of the things that we're talking about here requires right additional bandwidth to carry that, uh, you know, to enable those signals to go through. And I'm I'm going to put you on the spot here. I attended a, a presentation that was put on by the city of Richardson, which is physically where we are right now, uh, about two years ago. And uh, in fact, the building that we're in right here used to be. Um, uh, part of the Nokia uh, campus. Uh, so that said, the the challenge that was put out literally by the mayor Richardson was the fact that we've got all this massive, massive dark fiber that's running up and down our streets because, you know, this is the telecom corridor. How do we consume? What is the killer app for giga, giga bit um, uh, bandwidth so since you're kind of on that side what what cool stuff are you seeing today that's that's going to that require tons of dark fiber being turned on it, it it really it's really both the combination of of 5g which is being rolled out but it's the the edge computing mm -hmm. um is is really the the killer uh, bandwidth consumer right now because those devices are just now being turned up you know that capability is just now starting to come online and uh, you know that that's that's what's gonna that's what's gonna take most of this bandwidth is the is the edge computing because as we've talked about just today it, um, expanding the IOT applications the, the number of devices is going to almost be limitless in the applications. You know, when you think about, you know, a, a hundred different devices inside of a laundromat that's monitoring, you know, 
that's monitoring all the machines or you know even even high tech areas and especially like in our in our network like in server rooms you know there's there's tons of applications you know that are involved there so just the sheer volume of the number of devices that are going to be required is going to take that and and actually um i i misled a little bit the projects that i'm running are in california but i'm actually over on international in richardson in the old mci building uh, okay. at the verizon office there well i'm home of course now but that's where my main our main office is where that switch is um there um in right in the heart of the telecom corridor yeah all right so i'm gonna have to throw a bomb here in the middle um private lte 5G versus wired. Step back and get your comment on that. Kind of your your competitor would be wireless. Uh, what? Why go one way or the other? I guess op opinion <laughs> rather well, that's than what I'm for. <laughs> yeah, rather than technical. Um, you know, is it, really IP is really the IP networks, just because of the reliability standpoint. Okay. There's there's so much going on. I, I I read an article just this morning. As a matter of fact, um, I'm also a, a ham radio operator. Uh, and one of the things they were talking about in disaster preparedness um, was that in 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 the event of power going out and 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 disasters with cell towers being blown over or whatever, you know, a lot of the cellular communications will go out where you know you're going to have um, you know the potential for ham radio operators but also you know your landlines now power is going to be a whole separate thing but you know if you have backup so I, I would definitely lean more toward the uh, you know IP IP networks IP networks okay fantastic well as I said we're getting uh, to the top of the hour here I I want to make sure that we are um, you know everyone's had an opportunity to to voice some questions and any comments. Uh, uh, I'm just going to see if there are any ask here as we uh, conclude our, our meeting, the meeting after the meeting. Uh, is there any ask at this point of the group? Uh, any any uh, help, requests? Well, Gary, thank you for asking so many. First of all, just uh, thank you for hosting, moderating this uh, section. It's been fantastic, and I loved your questions, too. I mean, it's just... Uh, uh, I felt like we really did a deep dive, and that's, you know, anytime you want to, anytime you and John or, or even Andy want to just chat about Edge, I mean, I'm just uh, I'm fascinated by it, especially given that they're predicting that by sometime next year, the you know, they're saying right now 90% of the data is going to the cloud that are created by machines, I just read. and the, But they think that within two years, 75% of the data is going to be processed at the Edge. And I mean, that's just mind blowing, right? And uh, so hopefully as we can do these things, it'll be, um, we'll, we'll all be part of that journey. It'll be great. Yep. No, it's, it's uh, yeah. I'm sure all of us are in this because of, uh, you know, we, we love technology and love applying technology to business, uh, business problems, business issues. And we just love that win, uh, love that satisfaction. We've been able to make a difference. So, um, if there's any any last comments, if not, we'll uh, we'll conclude this meeting at this particular time. Uh, just remind everyone that we're gonna try to to uh, we're actually gonna be launching in two weeks our the happy hour, and we're hopefully gonna migrate into a format a lot like what we just went through here in the last uh, uh, last hour, and just a real interactive conversation, and um, you know as I said, throw some bombs in the middle and and see um, kind of how. People ferret out different ideas and different ways of approaching problems and issues and using applying technology. So that said, um, just one last time, any any questions, comments um, uh, at this point? Hey, uh, thanks everyone. Great discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, we're closing it down here in uh, Richardson, and again, uh, we really appreciate you guys all sticking around for this uh, meeting after the meeting. And uh, hopefully we'll catch all of you uh, on April Fools for a happy hour. That said, everyone have a great day and uh, it's Friday. <laughs>
<laughs> <laughs> Talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.